may have trouble connecting. Uh, my name is Chris Wolves. Uh, this is my first time uh, on one of these calls for the Drupal Working Group with ESIP, so uh, uh, thank you for uh, the chance to join. And uh, we have a great topic lined up that we're going to cover, and so on behalf of Adam, let me just kick it off. Um, today we are going to be uh, giving a presentation um, and hopefully having a lot of uh, good questions and answers about the development of the globalchange.gov website. Um, uh, if we could go to the, um, to the second slide. Um, we'll get, we'll get some, some background about the project. Uh, we'll talk about the client, the U.S. Global Change Research Project, uh, and, and the approach for the project. We'll talk about the methodology, which I know is of, of great interest to this group around the technical details of how we approached it, but we'll briefly touch on how we went through strategy and design and then development and hosting and ultimately launch. Uh, we'll mention what might be next for this project and then uh, hopefully spend most of our time in questions and answers. Um, so uh, today again presenting, I'm Chris Wold, I'm with Forum One Communications, we're a digital agency that worked on this project. Uh, with me is Keenan Holloway uh, and Sarah Lane Nguyen, one of our, but from our technical team, and we're also really pleased to have Glynis Lau here, who is the Chief of Staff for the National Climate Assessment with the U.S. Global Change Research Project, Research Program. Um, uh, again, we're Forum One Communications, or Forum One, we're a digital agency that focuses on digital solutions for uh, organizations working on policy issues, and we've been doing that for about 17, 18 years. Uh, on this project, uh, we had several partners. Uh, again, we were serving as a consultant to USGTRP uh, and uh, UCAR. Um, Anti-Static is a design company that partnered with us on this. Uh, a large uh, a piece of the project, also the, uh, the NCA report content itself, was designed and developed by a company called Habitat 7 and then developed out by a group CICS. So they all were involved. Um, one additional note, um, the globalchange.gov website is an umbrella site that talks about the overall global change research uh, program uh, and the specific content for the third national climate assessment report, which just came out this spring. The actual pages presenting the report content is on a sub subdomain, nca2014.globalchange.gov. Uh, that was developed uh, and, and there's a slightly different subsite within the main site uh, developed uh, by the Habitat 17. Um, let me introduce uh, Glynis to give a little background about the climate assessment and the USGCRP. Hi, everybody. So one of the things driving us to as USGCRP, and I'll explain a little bit about our organization in a minute, but one of the main motivations that we had for uh, working with Forum One to launch a new website was the, the development and release of the third national climate assessment. The third national climate assessment included contributions from over 300 authors, including government and non-government scientists and experts. The report incorporated comments from thousands of people and organizations, as well as numerous technical inputs and workshops. And I hope that you've heard about it by now because we've had a lot of press articles since the White House released it on May 6th this year. Uh, the assessment focuses on what we know now about past and present climate change, about projected future changes in climate, and about climate change impacts on specific regions of the U.S. and sectors of the economy and society, such as infrastructure, human health, and agriculture. In short, the assessment tells us what's happening to the U.S. as a result of climate change and how we know. So when it came time to develop a new website, uh, we wanted to make sure that it focused a lot on the NCA, but also made the work of the whole program very useful. And our job at the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP, was to coordinate the development, production, and release of the assessments. USGCRP itself is a, a fairly small federal entity that coordinates a much larger program. We coordinate and integrate the research related to climate change that's conducted across 13 federal agencies. Those agencies range from the, the very science-focused agencies like NASA and NSF to agencies that focus more on, on decisions and implementation like uh, the Health and Human Services, Department of Transportation, and Department of Defense. 
USUCRP itself, the small office here, is overseen by a, a subgroup of the National Science and Technology Council and also by the White House Office of Science and Technology. So USGCRP, and, and when I say USGCRP, I mean the, the 13 federal agencies that collaborate together. Uh, we have a, a number of goals. The overriding one is to empower the nation with global change science. Uh, global change includes climate change, but also includes processes like global development and land use change that can interact with climate to affect the Earth system. The USGCRP accomplishes this goal with a four-pronged approach. The first is to advance the multidisciplinary science of global change by coordinating across all the agencies. Secondly, we work to use that science to support decisions on adapting to climate change and mitigating the effects of climate change. Third, we work to conduct a sustained and engaging process to assess the impacts of climate change and responses in the U.S. and globally, that's where the NCA fits in. And finally, we work to communicate with and educate a variety of stakeholders about the program's global change research. For that last goal, uh, communicating and educating, redesigning our website, globalchange.gov, was especially important. So our objectives with this project, as I mentioned, one of our main goals is taking advantage of the release of the NCA report uh, to launch a new website. Uh, our team members down at uh, Kix NC and Habitat 7 were working hard on uh, making some really nice pages for the NCA, a really nice site that showcased that report specifically. And we wanted to be able to use globalchange.gov to support the dissemination of that report. We also wanted it to be able to support future reports and other agency content. And we knew that a smooth launch of the entire package was really critical to getting the NCA report in the hands of as many people as possible. We also wanted to use the opportunity to provide distinct pathways into the report from different parts of globalchange.gov, no matter where a user might have found the site. We wanted to showcase content derived from the NCA, other, other materials or handouts. And it was also important to us that the site be very beautiful and truly accessible and enticing for the various audiences for climate change impact information, both globalchange.gov itself and the subsite at NCA 2014. Um, thanks, Glennis. I mean, the, briefly, the approach we took to the project was in, in two big steps. We had an initial project that was strategy and design that took about six months and, and uh, really worked with the uh, USDCRP team to understand what the new site needed to do for them and how it needed to weave together content, uh, longstanding content, as well as the content from this new report. And then the development of the project uh, was completed in about five months, um, including a, a lot of content migration, the ongoing hosting, a lot of, uh, with the site getting a lot of attention. Um, let me say a few words about strategy and design, and then we can get to the technical issues, which I think are probably of most interest to all of you. Um, again, the objective here, we had to incorporate content from the um, NCA3 report from the Global Change Information System, a database of federal climate research information, uh, and other content that had been on the, in the, uh, on the globalchange.gov site for a long time. Um, we were starting with an old site uh, that, that had looked kind of dated and really wasn't serving the needs of USTCRP any longer. Um, just some familiar things we did along the way was uh, conceptual wireframes uh, and then a more detailed HTML prototype just to make sure we had the structure, the content, the usability uh, well defined. Uh, we then moved on to the visual design and then really took an approach of using very big, strong visuals to create an emotional connection to this content, really marrying scientific information with some um, emotion-grabbing visuals. Um, and we have the interesting challenge on this project of uh, really speaking to varied audiences, non-scientific audiences such as the public and the media, uh, to get them introduced to the issue at an appropriate level, but also we knew that a large share of the audience for this was an audience that is pretty savvy about the issue and the science and the policy. So you could see here in this schematic of the climate change 
uh, understanding page that uh, we took a layered approach with, uh, you know, starting with the general intro, what's happening, ramifications of the issue of, of climate change, and then getting into more detail and leading people into more you know, more detailed content. So it was deliberately to meet the needs of these different audiences. Um, and similarly with the regions and topics page, you can go to the next slide, where again we start out with a broad overview and then give people the ability uh, to drill in to see climate change impacts and issues at a regional level, which we knew would be of interest to some audiences and for other audiences and let them find it information at a topical level if that's their professional uh, interest. Um, um, the site, again, had other ways to allow people to explore content, a variety of resources. We had a lot of data and multimedia to incorporate. Um, again, for people who are looking for more detail, we really wanted to provide some depth for them. Uh, and then, real importantly, uh, one of the key objectives for the project was to make it available and very usable across a variety of screen sizes. So we made it, uh, using a responsive design approach, we made it very friendly for mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, and, and various screen sizes, um, using a, a newly developed Form 1 UX custom Drupal theme. We can say more about that if it's of interest. Um, let me turn it over now to Sarah and Keenan to talk some about the technical approach we took. Sure. So into uh, the technical overview, um, essentially we started off with uh, the, the way the site looked in, in its um, older form. Um, and of course the site included a limited data migration. The existing site, or the site previously was um, done in Joomla. Um, so of course we tried to use the, as the structure of how the content was already broken up in Joomla, um, as well as some of the various RSS feeds that are offered um, by that tool to try to pull in as much of the content as we could. Um, most of the content was pulled in uh, with feeds through uh, various feeds importers. Um, and also uh, there was some content that we sort of had to come up with clever tools to sort of scrape out of the existing site. And for that, we use uh, custom scripts just for sort of scraping um, the site and grabbing the components that we need it. Um, some of the notable modules that we use, and uh, these are sort of modules we use in general for the majority of our projects, um, are of course the Chaos Tool Suite, which includes views, panels, panelizer, uh, page manager, uh, co context, and display suite. Um, and of course, does get us a fair bit of most of the face of the site done. Um, we of course use feeds um, in the various components of feeds, so feeds uh, JSON parser, feeds uh, temp feed self no uh, pre uh, processor as well. And of course, that just helps us to pull in the content uh, a lot more effectively. Um, we use Search API and Search API Solar for most of the searching components. Um, media, of course, just to, for the, um, essentially for the widgets for just sort of handling adding uh, media across the site. We use the commerce module in ways that we'll uh, define later. And of course, um, m the majority of our projects, we use uh, features, of course, and that's our way of capturing any of the configuration that is needed um, in the project. All right, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Great, so Great. now I'll briefly discuss uh, four or five features that really made um, the development process of this site unique and challenging for us. Um, the first, as Chris alluded to when he started, um, there were really two sites uh, in, under the globalchange.gov umbrella. There was a site, uh, NCA 2014, on a subdomain, um, and then there was the www site. So Forum 1 led the development on the www, and another group worked on the report site. But we wanted them to uh, share some features so we put them in a multi-site environment. Um, they share one database uh, with a few tables shared mainly for kind of single sign-on for administrators to make that a little bit easier. And on the back end, um, we're using solar in order to power uh, a, a global search uh, for both sites. And so the user interface for that global search looks like this. So on the www site, you can enter your keywords and then choose which site you want to pull results from. The next feature was an integration with the GCIS API. Um, so our goal was to populate Drupal with content from the API available on data.globalchange.gov. 
Um, that API makes data available in a number of different formats, including XML and JSON. Um, we use JSON and use the Seed's JSON Path Parser importer um, in order to pull that data into Drupal and map it to fields within our, our selected content types. Um, Seed's self node processor uh, is a, a module that we used because the API was sort of set up as a two hop. Um, in other words, we needed to make an API call to get a listing. Um, of, of content, and then we needed to make a second API call to get all the details related to a single record. Um, we used the Stamper because we needed to do a tiny bit of data massaging once it was pulled into Drupal. Um, and an ongoing challenge that we continue to face is um, finding a good way to track the metadata between the two systems. So that's definitely something that we're still working on. So this slide shows what um, a report looks like on GCIS over on the left side of your screen. Um, they do make all the data available in HTML too. Um, and then once it's pulled into Drupal, this is what it looks like on the www site on the right side of the screen. The next feature is that we, we wanted to uh, pro provide a, a nice interface to allow users to drill into very scientific data um, as quickly as possible to find what they wanted and was most relevant to them. So we did that by coming up with an architecture to define separate content types and then apply vocabulary terms from, or economy terms from six different vocabulary. And then we use Search API and Facet API to build a, a Facet interface um, so that you could quickly drill in. So that's what uh, this screenshot shows. Um, you can kind of see the facets over on the right. Topics and regions and organizations over on the lower right are all taxonomy terms. Um, because taxonomy plays such a huge role in this site, we really wanted nice one-stop pages that uh, kind of encompassed all the information we could present about a given term. So our strategy for that was to create um, really rich, uh, beautiful taxonomy term pages. And we did that using Panels and Page Manager um, to override the default Drupal system taxonomy term page and then populate it um, with all kinds of content that's relevant to that term. So this is an example of one of our topic term pages. Next, because a lot of our content included scientific terms that not all of our audience members might be familiar with, uh, we, we wanted to provide inline definitions um, to, to those terms so that users could simply mouse over a term and get the definition right right on the page. So we use the lexicon module uh, to provide that. Um, that module gives us a, a text formatter, um, and then it maps to uh, a vocabulary where all the terms and term definitions are stored. And when you apply the formatter to your content, it just automatically drops the links in and uh, provides the markup with the definition so that you can just hover over and see the definition. The module also provides a nice glossary page that lists all the definitions and all the terms used on the site. So this is an example of how that module works. Um, extreme weather is a taxonomy term. Um, the term definition is in that yellow bubble. Next, a few of the reports um, were needed to be available for users who wanted to order a printed copy. Um, and we wanted to provide a familiar experience to users in order to, to order those copies. And so we wanted to do a accept shopping cart. So we used the commerce module uh, in order to provide that interface, uh, which gave us a nice interface for both the user and on the administrative end for fulfillment. Um, it was a little tricky to wrangle commerce into allowing us to order free products and not process a, a payment or a transaction, um, but we were able to do it. And so this is a screenshot that shows a report that can be ordered just by clicking on the Add to Cart button. And now Keenan will talk a little bit about our development workflow. Sure. Just to say a little bit about the development workflow, um, essentially we use um, agile methodologies um, for uh, for this project. Um, there was a total of um, eight development sprints. Um, one of the sprints was uh, where there was a testing sprint, and there was also a QA sprint. 
Um, we have well-defined branching strategies that we use. Um, typically, we use a three-branch model. So we have a master branch, which is essentially our development branch. And this is, of course, where ongoing development is happening. And it's, of course, tied to the development uh, server. Um, we have a staging branch. And essentially, um, this is what we consider the stable branch. Um, and this is, um, of course, where we have our bug testing happening, um, and this is where we can sort of hopefully catch things um, before or prior to uh, deploying to production. And the final branch is our live or, or production branch, which is mapped to the live uh, environment. And this is, um, of course, tagged off for different releases from the stable branch. Um, we also... Um, of course, have local development environments set up. We typically use Vagrant, um, and that just sort of is a nice way to give us a, um, a, a an environment that essentially allows us to mimic the server configuration and the server setup where the actual site was going to live, so it helps alleviate any surprises uh, as we develop code. Um, and of course, it also assists with sort of um, linking um, any changes that we build to the various um, development, uh, staging, or production environments. Um, and for that is the last point of we use uh, continuous integration. Um, and we we use GitHub for, um, of course, um, the repositories are Git, so we use GitHub for um, hosting those repositories. And uh, we have the, the Capistrano, which handles some of the automated deployment um, strategies and functionalities to um, allow us to essentially be able to push branches and have automated um, migration or deployment of our changes to the various em environments and sort of do some of the some of the lighter uh, lifting with moving the code and running any of the typical Dresh commands that we normally run when code is being deployed. Um, from there, I'll speak a little bit about the hosting of the site, which was also done. Um, of course, with the uh, based off of the web traffic that we were expecting to get um, from looking at um, the previous release of the NCA um, report, as well as um, the I IPCC report, um, which had about uh, 80k uh, hits, um, we were estimating that essentially we'd have about 100k visits, um, page views, and about 10,000 plus. Um, report downloads, and we, we pretty much hit that and exceeded that in the first 24 hours of the site being released. Um, of course, to handle that load, we had various caching methods in place. Um, one of them, of course, the most basic one is this um, alternative PHP caching or APC. Um, of course, we use Varnish and Cloudflare. Um, and of course, uh, Varnish being our our localized caching method, and Cloudflare being a sort of a delivery network uh, caching level. Um, we use Memcache to try to to uh, cache as many of the database calls as much as possible to um, keep that down. And we also um, had sophisticated cache clearing rules. Um, with um, Varnish specifically. So what that allowed us to do is clear cache on, on sort of a smaller scale, depending on which code is actually being updated. And this is sort of with the assumption of any hot fixes or anything like that with the production site. And it essentially allows us to only care, clear caches that are relevant for the components that we're deploying and not the entire site, which was a huge help in um, keeping the cache up and in place as much as possible. Um, and of course, uh, one of the also, uh, I guess another um, very good thing that was in place is we pre warmed the cache, which essentially we had crawlers that would actually go out and crawl the entire site um, to essentially create cache versions of as much as possible. So that way the cache was sitting there and warm and ready for public hits as opposed to allowing the public to sort of start generating that cache. And what that translates to is uh, essentially during our launch day, only 5% of the traffic that was actually coming to globalchange.gov was actually delivered or traffic that was handled by the actual Drupal site itself. And the, the rest of that traffic was essentially satisfied by the various caching levels. And with that, I will turn it back over to Sarah. We'll talk about the launch. Okay.
Yep, so I'll just give a few details about the launch. Um, on May 6th, we were front page news in every major media market. Um, Google Analytics reported some of these sites as our top referrers. Um, so as you can see, major media organizations, but also um, organizations like the Weather Channel. Um, the report and website were also mentioned in broadcast media. Um, thanks to the White House PR team, um, morning shows were given the opportunity to um, have their meteorologists interview the president on climate, climate change. Um, so we got a lot of traffic just based on the URL being mentioned on broadcast media as well. We also got a big boost from social media. Um, this is probably our favorite tweet about the project, so it, it certainly helped to get a nice retweet from the president himself with our URL in it. At a stakeholder event for the report release, the White House stakeholder event, um, the cadets give our team a shout out. So we were very thrilled to see that and um, definitely glad to see that the White House appreciated um, all the work of our team over many months. And just a few statistics about um, launch. In the 48 hours after launch, we did about 250,000 um, viewers, and then we had about 850,000 page views. In the first week after launch, we moved about 2.5 terabytes of PDF uh, downloads of the report itself. So just to talk a little bit about what's next for the project, we continue to expand the GCIS integration with additional content, additional data, um, and to try to, as I mentioned before, kind of work out some of the metadata tracking issues that I alluded to. Um, we also continue to just deepen the content and add um, more to the Explore section on different topics that users might find relevant and useful. Um, and we continue to look for ways to best support future reports uh, on this on this site. Um, and perhaps Glennis can speak a little bit more to that if there are any specific questions. And with that, uh, we'll conclude our prepared presentation and um, open it up to questions. Great, thanks. This is Chris. Is, is Adam or David there to take Q&A or lead the Q&A? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, David here. Yeah, I, to start off, I had one question. Um, it, was, it was an interesting strategy to, to crawl the site to pre-cache the pages before members of the public hit them. Um, how did you set that up? Sure. Um, essentially, we just um, had a crawler, a crawler script, um, and uh, another member of the team actually um, can get even more of the basics uh, or the details about that. But essentially, it's just a script that allowed us to essentially crawl the entire site and just basically use the typical strategies of um, essentially going to every page, extracting every URL possibility from that page, and essentially cr calling a page head on that. And um, we essentially just let that spider the entire site sort of, and um, just that alone, of course, as um, it's going through those pages, it's essentially um, creating the request that's basically going to cache the pages and all the various components that, like, uh, that we're caching, essentially. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm sorry for the technical problems we had, but it sounds like um, Bruce managed to step in and uh, it seems like the meeting's gone pretty well, so thanks. I'll, I'll open it up to any, any other questions. Now, this is Bruce. I put a question on the chat. Um, I'm wondering if you had any budget to do infographics uh, uh, or content generation beyond the, you know, pulling the images that were available to you. Um, I could take that one. Uh, we really didn't spend a lot of time doing infographics. On the regions and topics pages, we did do um, a, a map uh, that divided the U.S. into regions, uh, the U.S. and its territories. I should be more specific about that. Um, but that, that's, it's really just intended as a navigational device to allow people to um, figure out what regions they're interested in, click on it, and then get uh, 
routed to a, a term page all about that region. Um, but that's really the only feature on the site that I would consider a, an infographic. Um, obviously, we're pulling a lot of data from GCIS and um, including a lot of images uh, that appeared in the report and that might just be parts of the research that supported the report. And so I'm sure that um, scientists would probably consider some of those images infographics, um, but in, from a data storage standpoint, uh, they are image files that are just embedded into our templates. And this is Glynis. Thank you, Sarah, for that. We, we, for the part of the globalchange.gov development, we didn't have at USCCRP any budget for that. If you look at the NCA 2014 subsite pages, there are some interactive graphics in there that were developed specifically for the report by the, the team um, in North Carolina. Uh, April and Angel are on the phone as well. And then also just to note that we have plans to expand our, our suite of interactive uh, graphics in the future as part of an indicators project that we're preparing to launch. Yeah, thank you. I think people underestimate the value of, of uh, that kind of graphics for people who are uh, just approaching the, the, you know, the topic from the first time. Absolutely. We wished we could do more. Thanks, Bruce. Does anyone else have any questions? So it looks like there's one in the chat. So did we harvest content from the report itself? Um, I, I guess that's sort of a, a little bit of what um, they were just speaking to. Um, of course, we were using uh, the, um, the the imagery as one source of the content that was pulled essentially from the API, but um, essentially um, many of the, m m m even more information is available in the API and we are pulling that in as uh, much as possible in the site. And of course the, the way that the um, the report site was built itself, it sort of um, allowed the user to step through different components of the actual report itself. So, um, of course, we didn't want to do much more than um, was already sort of very orchestrated um, in that delivery. Um, I don't know, does anyone else have anything they wanted to add to that? Also to note that the report itself, the subsite for the report itself, globalchange.gov and the API were all being uh, worked on, finalized, and polished up simultaneously. Uh, so uh, we, one of the things that we've done since launch is to uh, form one has added the multimedia part of the of globalchange.gov, which pulls a lot of those NCA, all of the NCA images and the metadata uh, directly into uh, a, a viewable gallery from the API. Um, I hope that covers your question, Jim. Uh, so there's a question from Bruce. Um, did the site get a spike in interest this week? I don't know. I haven't looked at the, the analytics. Have you, have you looked at it, Keenan or Sarah? Um, I haven't taken a look at it myself. We generally see that um, Mondays are our biggest days and it, it tapers off through the weekends. That's just a, a typical pattern that we get. Um, but we might have gotten some more things this weekend. I knew there was, a, I did get a lot of Google hits this weekend and I have a standing thing set up for National Climate Assessment. So we'll take a look. Great. Um, so I have another one. It seems like you, you served a lot of file downloads of content with the report. Um, did you have a particular caching strategy for that, or, or how did you approach serving that that, that amount of uh, file downloads? Actually, that was another um, point of uh, the site where Cloudflare was actually really helpful in caching that, because essentially um, we could essentially have that external Cloudflare service um, cache that. 
um, and, and it did a it did a great job of being able to keep this site up, even though you have those long sort of uh, download requests happening of the report in various forms. Because some of them, the, the essentially the way it was broken up is the entire report was available um, in a low resolution and a high resolution version, and the high resolution one, of course, had the hardest um, imprint on uh, just how, the size of it, and we also broke up the report into smaller sections. And of course, the design behind that is that hopefully if people were interested in particular sections as opposed to the entire report, then that's a way to reduce the download happening if they go just for the sections that they are interested in. Right, so you were using the um, CDN ready to distribute that amount around as far as possible within Kafka. Yes, that's correct. Cool, thanks. Any other questions? There's one from um, Cian. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, is the filter tool used on a variety of pages? A standard filter, a Drupal tool? Is it page level or driven by site-wide metadata? By topic, by publication year. I didn't quite catch the entire question. Um, the, the filtering or the faceting um, was used on a, a variety of different pages. Uh, those are search API driven views, and then we're using Facet API in order to provide the taxonomy term and concept type filtering. Um, and it definitely was a design pattern that we used on, on multiple views throughout the site. Right. So essentially, it's faceting on solar index content is the way it works. So um, I jumped in a little late, but um, so you said you had two sites and you were sharing content but using solar. Um, what were the two sites and, and how did that work? We have um, one site on a, on a subdomain uh, that supported the, the NCA3, the report um, specifically, and then we also had the www site which um, provided a lot of supporting documentation and content for the report um, and is also intended to have kind of a longer shelf life and support future reports. Um, we put them in a multi-site architecture so that they could more easily share content. Um, in the end, uh, the main feature that pulls them together is kind of a, an interface that allows you to search both sites um, at once. And that's provided by using Search API, um, searching the, the solar indexes for both sites which are independent, um, and then we're using Search API pages in order to kind of build that interface. Cool. So it's essentially a shared index that, depending on the result, takes you to one side or the other. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing. Maybe Keenan heard that a little better than I did. Yeah, I did. And yeah, you're right. Essentially, there's uh, uh, both sites have solar indexes, and they're able to share the indexes um, on either side. OK, thanks. Um, to anyone who didn't hear that, I was just asking if the index is shared, and then clicking on a particular link takes you to the particular subdomain. Um, so, okay, Bruce has a question. Um, is there something you would do differently if you were starting today? Other than dramatically more time and or uh, different products being completed in sequence instead of all together? I'm not sure. Form 1, what do you think? Or April and Angel? Uh, Sarah, I'll let you answer. 
<laughs> okay, um, I would say um, it's possible at the end of the day we did not need to set up the sites in a multi-site architecture, um, especially since we're now considering splitting them up. Um, when we started the process and decided on that architecture, we had kind of greater plans for sharing content than uh, what we ultimately launched with. Um, and right now it is not technically necessary for those two sites to be in the same database. So that's potentially one thing that um, I might rethink if I were to approach the site build again. So I use the main module to provide the multi-site or some other approach. Um, sorry, was that a question? I couldn't hear. Yeah, so are you using the, so how are you providing the multi-site architecture? Uh, the current multi-site architecture is actually provided in similar ways, um, the sort of the similar Drupal way in that they um, they both have the same Drupal core um, uh, uh, code base that they're sharing, and of course uh, each site is a site instant in that um, in this sort of uh, sites sort of folder, and essentially from there they they have some modules that they both share that are common that are of course in sites all, and then they have some that are very specific um, that are only in that sort of sites instance. Um, and then, of course, there's just other things as far as uh, sharing uh, pretty much the like databases and um, all that, all those type of things. And then, of course, they have um, they have access to share the same solar, which is how you get the integrated search. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, sure. So, Bill has another question. Um, how does a new data set? get into globalchange.gov so that it shows up in a search result. Uh, does the data producer register it or do you harvest it? So we essentially are harvesting it from the GCIS API. So um, we have a, a feed importer um, set up on the Drupal side of things that every 24 hours holds um, an endpoint in the GCIS API looking for new data sets. Um, if there is one, a new node is created and the content is pulled in, um, and upon save, uh, it is added to the solar index and therefore would show up in any solar powered views or in the search index itself by a keyword search. And for adding new data sets into the API so that they can be pulled into globalchange.gov, uh, right now we've been focused on just populating the data sets that were used in the National Climate Assessment. I know that uh, many of you at ESIP might have seen presentations or, t or talked to uh, some of the USCCRP team that's working on the GCIS and, and working to populate those things. Uh, Brian Duggan, Steve Allenbach, Kurt Films, Robert Wolf, and, and Justin uh, Goldstein have all been involved in ESIP meetings. So we, right now we're focusing on NCA data sets. We also have a, a chunk of NASA data sets that you can view through, I believe, data. I believe you can view them at the moment. I know they're there. Data.globalchange.gov. Um, and we're uh, as a program the, the path forward for populating those data sets in the future. Thanks. Um, how do you select the data set you want to import from the API? Is it based on the keyword or? Uh, from a technical perspective, um, anything that is added to the endpoint um, in the GCIS API can be pulled into Drupal. Um, so we're just we're simply calling a specific API endpoint and comparing the hashes of data sets that we've already pulled in to see if anything's been updated. And of course, if their hash doesn't exist yet, or we would pull a new record in. Um, Brennan probably has a few more comments on on how they have decided from like a business logic standpoint which data sets are going to be shared. I'd say that's under discussion. We're still working out those details. This is a, a, a new model for us, an exciting new website, and a, an API that's growing quickly. So we're still working out how to make those decisions.
So, um, does anyone else have any more questions? Um, feel free to. Uh, th th this is Bill. Uh, yeah, thanks for the earlier response. I guess a quick follow-up. So, do you currently harvest from the GCMD uh, at all? Uh, not for globalchange.gov. Uh, uh, Brian Dugan is working with uh, GCMD and and others on um, standardizing ways for to improve the communication between the GCIS and uh, other directories like that. But um, I don't think that's live at the moment. But I can. Okay. Haven't met Brian. Okay. But but that is something in the future. In the future, we see this uh, data.globalchange.gov uh, growing and connecting with a, a lot of different data initiatives across the government. That's that's, mm -hmm. what it was, that's why it's being driven from the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which is an, a, a good position to coordinate across the different federal agency initiatives. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Feel free to jump in or use the chat. Okay, so Jim writing up. Are you using a structured data schema for interoperability or sharing? Uh, let's see. Um, For example, audio. Or okay. Yeah, not in the current phase. When you say sharing, are you mean are you meaning to make the information further available to other things to consume, um, or are you do you mean just as far as social sharing? I would think. I would think in a semantic way to make it available to other tools. Um. Yeah, for for what we're doing now, we're essentially not um, we're not offering any uh, sort of structured share points um, beyond the things that we're consuming. More so because uh, our understanding is that this was not supposed to be a tool that would essentially try to replace the API. It would just sort of um, definitely lever leverage it in really clever and visual ways. Um, but of course, I'm sure everyone would be open to uh, new ideas about that. Is that on your question? Yeah, he says thanks. Um. Anyone else with questions? Just to, this is Glynis, just to note that the API can be viewed at data.globalchange.gov. And it's on GitHub as well. Thanks. Um, so does that... Um, repository include the whole site or is it certain technology used in the site? Uh, I'm probably not the best one to answer that question. It doesn't include everything that's in the site. Uh, it includes a, a lot of the, the content types. For example, all of the, for the NCA3, all of the figures are in there, all of the chapters, all of the authors. Uh, the metadata for the figures is being populated, and it, it pulls information from various places. And then globalchange.gov, which we call the front end, is used to make that information uh, pretty and accessible and, and easier to navigate. So data.globalchange.gov doesn't include everything, but it includes a large portion of the, the chunks and bits and pieces that are part of NCA and um, our image library for globalchange.gov, for example. That's great. Um, definitely great you're sharing that. Uh, thanks for flagging that, that up. Um, 
So we've still got 10 minutes left. Does anyone else have any more, more questions? Mm -hmm. Feel free to jump in if you do. Well, from Forum 1, we, we're pleased to have the chance to talk about it. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, we definitely appreciate it. Um, yes, thank you very much. Be interested to see how the site develops uh, in the future. So, uh, our next meeting um, is on Wednesday, October 22nd. And we'll be sending out details of that on the mailing list. And, uh, the site on groups.drupal.org. So look forward to seeing you all then. Um, thanks, everyone.